before I preach. Uh, it was about my grandmother. My grandmother made hooked rugs. Any of you know how to make a hooked rug? Huh? You take a piece of cloth and you run it through a grinder that puts it in a strip like that. It's messy. It, it goes all over the house. There's dust and scraps of metal a cloth everywhere. And, and every time I would go to see her as a child, her, her room was just covered with hooked rug stuff. They were beautiful when she got through with them. Uh, but uh, anyway, I didn't have a very good opinion of the hooked rug, even though I knew how much work went into it. And God gave me a, a message about the hooked rug. And uh, what happened with the hooked rug was that since we didn't, she gave Jan and I a hooked rug as we got out of the service and moved to Houston after we got married. And uh, we, we put it in a place of semi-prominence. And uh, we, we raised uh, poodles that one time in our life. And the, the rug got, you know, a little dirty and, and it was close to the utility room where the puppies were. And so the rug ended up being uh, a puppy bed. And then my grandmother came to see us. And I didn't think about it. And you talk about coming unglued. Whoa. So the sermon I preached was equating the rug to our wives. I had no appreciation for the rug. And God just spoke to my heart as I was doing that sermon. And he said, uh, uh, some guys treat their wives like you treated the rug. You know, they just don't give them any any worth, any value. They don't treat them like they're worth anything. And, and so that's a sermon I preached. And I don't know why Wayne remembered it so long, but, but I found out a few years ago after they came out here that he remembered that sermon. And, uh, and I thought, my goodness, I, I, I don't know how many people have ever remembered one, but he remembered that one a long time. Amen? So anyway, uh, I want to pray, and then I want to, well, no, I'm going to talk to you first. Uh, it is Father's Day, right? Uh, uh, I'm going to talk to you today about faith. Uh, we've been studying faith. That's kind of our, our topic for now. And I'm going to try to tie faith to, uh, to being a better father. Uh, but before we start, you know, talking about other types of fathers, I want to talk about our Heavenly Father just a moment. Uh, how many of you know that that uh, I sometimes feel like Father's Day really ought to be about Him because He is the Father of all. Amen? He's the creator of the universe. So I'm going to read you just a few scriptures about Him and then we'll get into the message. Uh, look at Isaiah 64, verse 8. It says, But now, O Lord, You are our Father. We are the clay. You are the potter. You know, if we could just keep that perspective, I think we could get along with him a whole lot better, although we get along better with him, but all, fine with him all the time. But it's his fault, not ours. Amen? Uh, he's the one. But you, we're, the, we're the clay and you're the potter, and we are the work of your hands. Uh, so he, he's all there is. You know, 1 Corinthians 8, uh, verse 5 says, for even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as there are many gods and many lords, and those are little letters in those, it says, yet for us, there is one God. Uh, there's only one true living God. Amen? Amen? A lot of people think there's other gods and other kinds of gods, and sometimes we make uh, things in our lives be more important than God, and, and then they become our gods. But there's only one, uh, uh, the Father of whom are all things, and we for him, and one, Je one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, and through whom we live. One, one scripture says, in him we live and move and have our being, live and move and breathe and have our being. I mean, he's all encompassing the world and everything in the universe is about him, and we don't always... We don't always realize it and keep it in our brains, okay? Ephesians uh, 4, verse 4, says there's, there's one body, one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. 
There's, there's one God, folks, and he loves us. And he sent his son to die on a cross so that we could have a relationship with him. And, and I just believe that, uh, you know, I, I, we ought to make at least the first part of this day totally about him. And we had some great, wonderful worship today, but I didn't see anybody get excited. Are any of y'all excited that God loves you, that he died for you so that you could be in a relationship with him? Well, well that's a good start for what I had in mind, but, but I'm just going to ask you, uh, if you're able, uh, you know, let's stand up, let's lift our hands, and, and let's make some noise and give him some praise. Clap, shout, scream, whatever you want to do. Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. It's he that we worship. It's he that we should be honoring on Father's Day. Amen? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Glory. Is that all the noise y'all can make? One more big shout. Amen. Amen. Don't you feel better now? Hallelujah. Thank you. Father, I just thank you that you loved us enough to, to send your son to die for us, Father. Lord, I thank you that you made a way for us to be uh, the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus so that you could live in us, so that we could be in the holy of holies. Someone shared earlier about the, the, uh, the curtain that separated the holy of holies, and when it was rent, uh, it allowed you to come live in us, and it allowed us to to sit in your lap anytime, Father. You made us righteous regardless of how we act. And I love you so much and I appreciate what you've done so much. Help us all to get a hold of how wonderful you are, Father, and how much you love us and your loving kindness and your grace and your mercy, Father. And Lord, just uh, anoint this message today and help me to bring it so that it helps us to, to change lives, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, are y'all ready to... Uh, Talk about faith and fatherhood. Okay. Um, so you, you might want to know what does faith have to do with fatherhood? Uh, I kind of asked myself that question when I came up with that title. Uh, the rest of the title is, uh, is uh, are you modeling what you say you are? Are you being an example? And that's where the faith comes in. Uh, faith has everything to do with everything. We know that, don't we? Tell me something that faith doesn't have anything to do with, and I'll show you something we shouldn't be involved in. Hello? Uh, that, that's, that's why we're studying it, and I'm attempting to connect faith and fatherhood. So uh, when do you quit being a father, and when do you stop trying to be a better father? How many of you were a father and aren't a father anymore? You know, even if our kids go before us and go to heaven, we're still a father. Amen? Uh, and we still have good memories. And, and if you don't have any kids, you can still be a father. Do you, do you guys know that if you don't have any kids? You can be a spiritual father. The world's crying out right now for, for men who are godly men, who are spirit-filled, who, who know the Word of God, to disciple young men, maybe who didn't have a good father. Uh, maybe men who don't know who their father is and, and maybe they can't identify with God because they didn't have a father, but you can be a spiritual father and you can come alongside them and you can teach them the word of God and you can befriend them. And sometimes you have to be a friend with them a while before you can get into to being a discipler. Uh, but, but that's a spiritual father. That's what he does. He, he takes care of those that are in need, those men that are in need. And uh, it's kind of like a big brother thing, except it's a whole lot more important, okay? Big brother's important, but big brother's not all about God and all about getting them to know God, I don't think. But anyway, uh, look at Hebrews 11, verse 6. Uh, it says, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is God and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. That's a very important verse. I don't know if you, if you get the full importance of it, but if, you don't, if you're not walking in faith, if you don't know faith, if you're not living in faith, then it's impossible to please God. You, just, you have to have faith to, to do what God wants you to do, to please him. Uh, and it doesn't say you should. It says in order to... 
It's impossible to please God, to please him, for he who comes to him must believe that he is. You've got to believe he's God, and you've got to believe he's a rewarder. If you think that God is a punisher, if you think that God's looking over your shoulder waiting for you to mess up so he can, so he can crack you your knuckles, you know, like some of the schools did in the old days, uh, you're wrong, and you can't please God if you, that's what you think about him. You have to come to know his true nature and character. You have to come to know his loving kindness. You have to come to know that, that once you trust him and he comes into your life and your heart, that even if you don't get it right away and even if you still keep messing up and doing things, he still loves you, and he doesn't hold the things that you do against you. That's his grace. That's his mercy. That's his love, and, and we have to get that part. So how do you diligently seek him? Uh, look at Proverbs 4, verse 20. It says, My son, give attention to my words. How do you give attention to his words? You pay attention to them. You've got to open the book. You've got to get in the book. You've got to look at God's words, and you've got to pay attention to them. means to notice them and to give, give some credit to them, give some weight to them, and know that what his word says is what we should be doing. You honor him in that way. Uh, give attention to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Uh, how many of you know what one of the most important things in communication is? Listening. 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 Do we listen to God? You know, you can hear his voice if you listen real close, but you can hear him a lot better if you get a lot of his word in you, in your heart and in your mind and in your spirit. Then you can hear him a lot better. But we... We have to pay attention, incline our ear to his sayings. Do not let them depart from your eyes. See, he's got you involved with your brain, with attention, with your ear listening, and now with your eyes. Do not let, do not let them depart from your eyes. Don't let what depart from your eyes? His word. Don't let his word depart from your eyes. Keep your eyes open. Keep your ears awake and keep your mind thinking about his word. Uh, that's, that's what we have faith for. For they, they what? They his words. They are life to those who find them and health to all their flesh. Anybody got any flesh that's not doing too well? Hello? Got some aches, got some pains, got some bumps and whatever else? Their health to all their flesh. And, and that doesn't mean, you know, if you just start paying real attention to him and focusing your eyes and your ears and everything on him today that you're instantly going to be that way. But if you stay focused, if you stay listening, if you stay uh, keeping him in your midst of your heart, eventually you'll start getting better. Amen? And if we just started out that way and stayed that way, I think we'd stay healthy all of our lives. You think so, Brother Dennis? But how many of us do it? And why don't we do it? We don't do it because we're not taught early enough. We're not, we don't do it because we're not mature enough. We, it's a growing process, and we have to reap some of the things that we sow. Keep your heart with all diligence. Diligence sure shows up a lot when they talk about God, doesn't it? Did you notice that? He's diligent towards us. We need to be diligent towards him. For out of the heart springs the issues of life. You know, God wants your whole heart. When he has your whole heart, you're going to have a whole lot more good issues flowing out of you. Uh, it says, but, uh, but put away from you a deceitful mouth and put perverse lips far from you. The only way you can do that is if you focus totally on God. Let your eyes look straight ahead and your eyelids look right before you. Uh, you know, they put blinders on a horse if he's kind of spooky and if he's pulling a wagon and he doesn't need to see what's behind him because it's going to either frighten him or distract him or cause him a problem. That's what we got to do. We got to put our blinders on and don't look at anything but Jesus, but Jesus' word and God's word. And we got to hide it in our heart and we got to keep going forward. And, and in case you don't know how this ties to fatherhood, all of this makes you a better father and it makes you a better husband. It makes you a better person. Uh, that's, that's what this is all about. Uh, ponder the path of your feet. Don't, don't just jump up and do something. Think about what you're going to do. Think about, is this what God's Word says? Is this consistent with God's Word? Is it going to bring glory and honor to God? 
or is it going to make you look like a non-believer to, to somebody who, who is a non-believer but who knows a little bit about how Christians are supposed to act? These are important questions. Ponder the path of your feet and let all your ways be established. How do you get your ways established? We just read it. All of the above is how you get your ways established. And once you get them established and you got your, your heart and your mind and your eyes and your ears full of his word, then that brings you to a place of being established. And I don't know if you can equate that or not, but how many of you would, would rather have a, an established yard rather than a yard with a lot of weeds in it and grass burrs and, and those big old prickly things that come up in the springtime? Yeah, an established yard looks, you know what an established yard, yard looks like, don't you? It's the ones you see at these big, fancy, expensive houses where they got a gardener that does nothing but keep their yard. They keep it watered. They keep it weeded. And once you get it established, it's easier to keep that way. But getting it that way is the problem. And the same thing applies to us. Getting established in God's Word is, is a lot up to us. And it's how diligent we are with seeking Him, how diligent we are with learning His Word, how diligent we are with, with a lot of things in our life. Amen? Uh, Hebrews 13, 5 and 6. Let your conduct, what, what is your conduct? Your conduct is, is your, your, your actions. It's what you do. It's, it's uh, uh, you know what conduct begins with? It begins with your attitude. Uh, let your conduct be without covetousness. If your attitude's wrong, your actions are going to be wrong. And you know, when you're raising your children, dads, uh, you can see when that, when that attitude changes, can't you? You know, somewhere between uh, uh, 9 and 13 or 14, when these boys get to thinking they know the, everything in the whole world, doesn't their attitude change? And right after that, their actions start changing. Amen? And if we haven't raised them right up to that point, uh, then we're in for some problems. And unfortunately, uh, I didn't raise mine right up through that point, and, and we had some issues. But praise the Lord, God changed Daddy a little bit, and Daddy became a little bit better father because, see, God brings beauty out of ashes. And it doesn't matter where we've been, how bad we've been, how bad the kids have been. God is a restorer. He's a restorer. So it's never too late. It's never too late to get started. Um, let your conduct be without covetousness. What is covetousness? It's to desire wrongfully or inordinately. In other words, you're over-desirous of something without regard to another's rights. So we're not supposed to be covetous. That's one of the Ten Commandments, right? Uh, be content with such things as you have. For he himself, capital H, he himself said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man can do to me. When you get to that place where you're not a man pleaser and you're not worried about what men think about you, you're free to live the life that God wants you to live. But as long as you're worried, which is a pride issue, uh, about what other people think about you, you're going to be inhibited to some degree from living the life that God wants you to live. So the question is, do you care more about God and, and all the wonderful, great things he has for us? Or do you care more about the image and what it looks like and what you have and, and what your calling in life is, you know? Are, are you mad at God for any of those things? That's an issue with some people. If they're not in the status that they like or they don't have the looks that somebody else has, uh, it can get in the way. The Lord is our, my helper. He wants to be our helper, and he doesn't want us to fear. He wants us to trust him, have faith in him, and trust him for everything in our lives. Uh, 1 Timothy 6, verse 6. Now, godliness with contentment is great gain. 
For we brought nothing into this world, and it's certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing, with these we shall be content. You know, it's, it's easy to be content if you're trusting God for everything that you need and everything that you have. And, and if you take the attitude that, that, Lord, I'm seeking you with my whole heart, and I'm trusting you to bless me, and I'm, I'm doing all I can. We don't ever, how many of you know if you just sit in a chair with your feet up and wait for God to, uh, to find you a job, you're not likely to get one. You've got to go out and look for it. We have to do our part, but God's like a, a block and tackle. When we do our part, man, he, you ever seen a block and tackle pull a big old engine? That one guy pull a big old engine out of a car with a block and tackle? Well, that's the way faith works. If we have the faith and we believe that God's going to help us and we go do our part, he puts the muscle to it. He makes it work. He brings it to pass. Amen. It's already done. It's already out there. If we have eyes to see, because faith sees not what is, but what isn't. It's already there, but we can't see it. And it manifests when we have the faith and believe that it's there and when we do our part. Um, look at, uh, what was I on there? Show me that back one. Hebrews 4.14. Um, for we have the high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, who can, who cannot, we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but was in all points tempted just as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. If you don't know God's love and God's mercy and God's loving kindness, you are not going to be able to crawl up in his lap when things are not going well. You have to know his character and his nature. Uh, and his grace and his mercy and his peace are everlasting if you're a believer. Mark eleven twenty. Now in the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree. You remember the fig tree? Jesus went by it in the morning and, and he was hungry and it had no figs on it and he cursed it. That's the story that we're talking about. Uh, they saw the fig tree, and, and uh, the fig tree dried up from its roots. And Peter, remembering it, said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered away. So what did Jesus say? He answered, he said, have faith in God. You might want to say that to yourself. Have faith in God. You know, you can talk to any of you, talk to yourself. That's one good thing to talk about. Talk to yourself and say, self, have faith in God. Self, have faith in God, and, and, and it's going to help you get there, amen? Why can you have faith with him? You can have faith with him because he, he owns everything. He's, he, he made us. He knows what's going to happen. Have faith in God, for assuredly I say to you, whoever says, you have to confess it, says to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, and don't, don't forget, one, one guy said to Jesus, he said, help my unbelief, Lord. So if you're tending to doubt, just say, God, help my unbelief. I want to believe. I do believe. Help my unbelief. Uh, be, uh, if, be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things which he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. You know why that happens? You know, you, you're not going to be trusting God with your whole heart. You're not going to be hiding his word in your heart. You're not going to be keeping it in front of your eyes and your ears and having it written on the front of your, your forehead. When, you, when you're in that position, you're not going to be wanting a new Cadillac or a new boat. You're going to be wanting something that has to do with the kingdom. And when you're in that position and you're trusting God by faith and you're asking for the things that God's already done and he's already working on and he's already got you picked out for, it's going to happen. Amen? But you've got a place to be diligent to get there. You don't get there by lollygagging around. And uh, I don't know if that's an East Texas saying or not. But uh, you don't get there by lollygagging around. You get there by being diligent and seeking him with your whole heart and going after him with everything that's in you and, uh, and abandoning yourself and your, your pride and your ego and, and everything else about you and just going for God. Just going for God all the way. Uh, he will have whatever he says. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them 
and you will have them. His hands, you will have them. Oh, that's another verse. I'm sorry. Uh, anyway, look at John 13, 3. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, you think that's just Jesus that, that came from God and was going back to God? What about you? What about me? Where did we come from? We came from God. And we're sojourners on this earth. This is not our home. We came from God and we're going back to God just like Jesus said he was and did. He, he went a little different than, than, than we go, you know I me. Mean? He, he was resurrected and went in, in a bodily thing up to heaven. And, and when we die, we're going to go as a spirit. But uh, unless, unless we're alive when he comes back, amen? And then we'll do it the other way. Uh, anyway, he came from God and he was going back to God. Uh, and this was, this was right at the, the Lord's Supper. And he arose from the supper table and he girded himself with a towel. You remember he was going to wash the disciples' feet and he poured the water in the basin and, and uh, he, uh, he went started washing their feet and he came to Simon Peter and Simon Peter said, he said, Lord, you, 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 you're washing my feet? And, and Jesus said, uh, what I'm doing, you don't understand now, but you will later. And what did Peter say? Y'all remember? He said, oh, no, no, you're not going to wash my feet. You're not going to wash my feet. Can you see yourself saying that to Jesus? And Jesus answered him. And this is uh, verse 8, picking up. Jesus answered him, and he said, if I do not wash your feet, you have no part with me. I think he was saying, if you don't really know me, Peter, if you don't really trust me, then you got no part with me. And, and dads and, and moms too, but that's the first way to being a good mom and a good dad is to be sure that you know him in a personal way. Be sure that you're connected to him in the right way and you've trusted him and invited him to be your personal Lord and Savior. Uh, anyway, Simon Peters, he got, he got with it and he said, well, not my feet only, Lord, but also my hands and my head. Uh, and then Jesus told him, he said, who's bathed needs only to wash his feet, but he's completely clean. And you're clean, but not all of you. Skip down to uh, verse 14. Jesus told him then after he got through, he said, uh, he said, if I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. You know what it means to wash somebody else's feet? You know what he was telling them? He was telling them, I'm God. I'm your Lord. I'm your teacher. I'm your superior. But yet I humble myself and, and I just put a towel around me and I got down on my knees and I washed your feet. I washed your feet. So why aren't you washing everybody else's feet? You know, that's an humble thing. That's humbling yourself and serving. He didn't come to, to be to serve. He, he didn't come to be served. He came to serve. So what are you here for? Dads, moms, what are you here for? Are you here for somebody to serve you? You know, I, I had a story that I was going to read about a guy that, uh, that uh, was meeting with another guy. They were sitting at the coffee table, and he got up to go wash the dishes, and and uh, the guy was marveling that he helped his wife. And, uh, and uh, he said, oh, no. He says, I don't help my wife. I'm a partner with my wife. And this other guy said, well, he said, I, I mopped the floors for my wife the other day, and she never even said thank you. And he said, well, how many times did you thank her for cleaning the house and wiping the kid's face and doing all that stuff? How, how, how many times did you thank her for that, man? And it's a good story. I'll read it to you one day. I don't have time today. But, but, you know, that's laying your life down. Washing your feet is, is equivalent to laying your life down for somebody else, doing what's good for them, and, and giving up your life for, for them. Uh, he says, for I have given you an example that you should do as I have done. And fathers, if you're not, if you're not letting God 
give you an example by obeying his word and by getting into his word and listening to his word and doing his word, then you're not being the best father that you can be. If you're not raising your children up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord because of the Lord and because of his word, you're just not going to be, you, you may be an okay father. You may teach them sports. You know, we taught our kids, I'm ashamed to admit this, but we taught our kids camping at an early age before we got really connected to God in the right way. And, uh, and, and some of them are still connected to camping too much. Amen? But, uh, but at least they, they know God. And uh, some of them were still praying that they get connected up the rest of the way and start, you know, serving him with all their heart and all their minds. Uh, if you know these things, Jesus went on, he said, if you know these things, blessed are you if you know about them. Are y'all paying attention? What does it say? If you do them, knowing them and not doing them gets you zero. Knowing them and doing them gets you blessed. Do we get that? Amen? Look at Philippians 3.17. It says, brethren, join. This is Paul talking. He says, brethren, join in following my example and note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. For many walk, whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are enemy, They are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. This is giving you some don'ts, okay? This is giving you recognize some ways when you're not doing it right. Uh, Whose, whose glory is their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. You know, the scripture that says, uh, he who is friends with the world is an enemy of God. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. You can trust a God like that that made provision for you to be conformed to his image. In Romans, it says, you will be conformed to the image of my son. God has our best interest always in mind. That's why we can trust him and that's why we should trust him. Uh, look at uh, 1 Timothy 4.12. Let no one despise your youth but be an example to the believers in the world in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, and in purity. In purity. And Paul says, till I come, give attention to the exhortation, to doctrine. Do not neglect the gifts that are in you, which is given to you by prophecy with the laying on of hands. Meditate on these things. And, and this should be for your refrigerator, this next phrase here. Give yourself entirely to them. See, that's when you surrender fully to God. When you say, God, I want to be all you want me to be. I, I want you to guide my life and direct my life, and I give you full permission to, to, to bring me to the place that you designed me for. Bring me into the purpose and destiny that you have for me, and I want to submit to it, but you're going to have to guide me and show me where it is. Amen? Uh, that's, that's, that's where you want to go is you want to go where you can give yourself entirely to them and, and that's the same as giving yourself entirely to him that your progress may be evident to all fathers when your progress that you're a full blooded Christian spirit filled walking with God all the day, all the day trusting God and putting his word in your heart and in your mind and in your ears and, and keeping it always before you that's when your progress will be evident to all and I'll guarantee you this if, if you're saying you're a Christian and you're not living it your kids know it your kids know it when my kids were little uh, and, and we were going to church all of the time uh, we were Christians we were Christians, but without us knowing it, we were just kind of being religious. And, and I think that's one of the reasons that some of my kids had a hard time because they saw that we weren't real. We didn't know we weren't real. We thought we were doing a good thing. We thought we were living for the Lord. And, and we were doing a lot of things, but 
the, the purpose wasn't right, the motive wasn't right, and, and some of it may have been, I, I don't know what all the, the, the undercurrents were, but, but I know looking back, we didn't have near the relationship with God that we have now. We might have been trying to get it even, but we didn't have it yet. And uh, we, we, you know, God let us serve. And he let us work really hard, and he let us neglect our kids some because we were too busy doing that. And, and it caused issues in their lives that, they're, that some of them are still recovering from. Amen? So, fathers, I guarantee you, your kids know whether you're genuine or not. And, uh, and they don't have any trouble figuring it out. And it affects them adversely if they see you not being what you say you are. Do we get that? Uh, look at uh, Mark 12, 29. Jesus answered, uh, Jesus answered him. The first, they asked him what the, what the commandment, best commandment was. And he said, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And just to fill in the gap, you know, sometimes people don't know what, what love is. Uh, most of the folks around here do because I harp on it a lot. But if you go to Second John uh, verse 6, it says, and this is love. It's not a feeling. It's the acting according to God's commandment. That's what love is. That's the definition of love. So what this is saying is you act right with, to God with your whole heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and all your strength. And, and this is the first commandment. And the second is like this. You shall love, act right all the time to your neighbor as yourself. There's no other commandment greater than these. If we could get that one down, uh, you know, how much would it change our lives? Because I know some of y'all are like me and you don't act right all the time. But we can if we fully give ourselves to God and we fully get uh, disciplined about seeking Him. Um, Deuteronomy 6, verse 6. Uh, and these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and you shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand. You remember when you were in school, did any of you write the answers to some of the questions on the test on your hand? That's what you're supposed to do with God's Word. You're supposed to write some of it on your hand and put it in indelible ink so you can always look at it and remind yourself, this is God's Word. None of y'all ever did that, I'm sure, on, on the test, did you? Hello? Uh, you better not. Uh, you better not still be doing it. One kid back there raised their hand. Uh, <clears throat> you shall bind them as signs on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You're supposed to... The, the, the Jews used to hang little, little scrolls, little miniature scrolls, and they hung them from the little strings on their hat, and it was a religious sign of how spiritual they were. The more of them they had, the more spiritual they were. And that's where it came from. God said, you, you shall bind them as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house so you see them every time you go in and come out. Uh, Dad's, the, I don't know if you know it or not, but the, the spiritual legacy that you leave your children is worth more than all the riches in the world. You can't leave them anything more important than to have a spiritual legacy. Amen. That's what fatherhood is all about, is trying to leave your children a spiritual legacy. Look at Proverbs 22, verse 4. By humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. You want me to read that again? By humility and the fear, it doesn't say by smarts, it doesn't say by education, it doesn't say by, by being strict, it doesn't say by controlling them. It says by humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. Thorns and snares are in the way of the perverse. He who guards his soul will be far from, be far from them, far from the bad things. 
Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Now, some of us, when some people that have kids that, that went wayward and ran away and started doing bad things, some people, uh, I think, and, and I think I was probably one of them, uh, thought that that meant we raised them up in the right way, which we thought was the right way, but it didn't happen to be the right way, and that they'll come back someday. And, and I think it does mean that, but I think if you train them up in the way they should go and you pay enough attention to them and you do the right things with them, I don't think they ever go away. I think it means they just walk, walk in it all the days of their lives. Look at Jeremiah 29. I'm going to be through in a minute. I heard somebody say, huh. <laughs> uh, 24, 9, 20, 20, 22, 4. By humility and the fear of the Lord. I just read that one, didn't I? Look at Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you a future, to give you a hope. Then you will call upon me and pray to me, and I will listen to you. He gives us that, and when we do it, he listens to us, and, and he's there for us. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with your whole heart. You know, you can search for him in and around all the stuff that you're doing, and that's not your whole heart. When you make up your mind, you're going to get to know God and you get serious and you get in his word and you get a hunger for his word and you get a hunger to know him personally and individually. And that's why you're reading your Bible, not just to fulfill a, a daily Bible reading thing. That's when it gets a hold of you. Uh, when you search for me with all your heart, I will be found by you, says the Lord. I will bring you back from your captivity. You know, I don't know what kind of captivity you have in your lives, and, and many of us have had and some still have captivity in their heart. They're just, they're, they're controlled by something uh, external. And, and no matter what it is, God will bring you back from it if you just start searching for him with your whole heart and seeking him with your whole heart and soaking yourself in his word and listening to it. Uh, there are many plans, Proverbs 19:21. There are many plans in a man's heart. Nevertheless, the Lord's counsel, that's what will stand. You know, you can plan anything you want to, but if you're planning aside from God's ways and God's word and God's purpose for you, chances are it isn't going to work. But when you get to know God and you surrender your life fully to God, when you become fully involved with God, he's going to guide you in the paths of righteousness and he's going to bring you around to to his counsel, and he's going to bring you around to what will stand. What is desired in a man is kindness, and a poor man is better than a liar. The fear of the Lord leads to life, and he who holds it will abide in satisfaction. He will not be visited with evil. There is no downside to selling your whole body, soul, and mind out to God and seeking him with your whole heart. There's just no downside to it. You're going to give up some things, but you're going to get things that are, that are so much greater and so much more filled with joy and peace and everything else that you, you just, you're never going to look back and regret it. Uh, the fear of the Lord leads to life, and he who has it will abide in satisfaction. He will, be, he will not be visited with evil. Galatians 6, I'm getting through. Galatians 6, verse 7 says, do not be deceived. Don't forget that you have an enemy that's prowling around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And if you're just lollygagging around, he may devour you for a season. Amen. Even if you've trusted him as your Lord and Savior, but you kind of get off the path and, and you're lollygagging around and you let him get you out of the word, uh, it's not a good thing. God is, be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. Corruption is not a good thing. You understand that, right? Uh, but he who sows to the Spirit, you understand that's what we've been talking about. Most of this is sowing to the Spirit, trusting in God, giving yourself to him fully. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. But, but it's not just that you reap everlasting life. You get a lot of good stuff along the way. Amen? 
And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those of the household. You know, the bottom line, uh, you're, either, you're either influencing others with your life, and if you're not doing that, you're being influenced by others. The best scenario is to be influenced totally by God, block out the world, block out the things of the world to the best of your ability, and surrender your lives to God. You're either influencing others or you're being influenced by others. And, and the way to, to not be influenced by others is to give yourself to him, to surrender your life totally to him. Start seeking him with your whole heart. Start getting in his word. Start learning his word. Start putting his word into practice and just keep on keeping on. Amen? That's the only way you're going to get there. Whether you're dads, whether you're moms, whether you're kids, no matter what you are, that's, that's how you get there. So I just want to give you an opportunity before we close. We've got a couple other things we're going to do, but, uh, but you know, there may be people here that are, that are not saved, that haven't fully trusted Jesus as their, their Lord and Savior. And you may be saved, and, and you're just not really letting him have his way in your life. And you may want to just make some decisions today. So I just want to, I just want to open up a time for you. Just bow your heads a, a moment. And just ask God what he's saying to you today. Just ask him what, what he's putting in your heart. You probably already know, but take time to listen for a minute. You know, if you've never trusted Jesus before and surrendered your life to him, uh, there's no better time to do it than today. So if there's anybody here who, who can't say with certainty that if you died tonight that you'd go to heaven and you know you would, then I'd like you just to raise your hand and let me lead you in a prayer. You don't have to pray it out loud. I'm not going to make you come down front or anything. I'm just going to lead you in a prayer that you can pray in your heart and trust Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And my Bible says if you do that, you only have to do it once and from then on. He is your Lord and Savior. And he'll always be with you and he'll never leave you and forsake you. Anyone that wants to pray that prayer today, anywhere. Well, there seems to be no one, but there may be someone who, uh, who is not seeking God the way we've talked about. And, and maybe you want to, you know, the scripture says repent. And, uh, and repenting is, is being aware that you're going in the wrong direction and doing an about face and going in the other direction. Maybe you were saved a long time ago. Maybe you just haven't followed him and trusted him. And if that's you, I'd like to lead you in a, a repentance prayer, just saying, God, I, I've been going the wrong way, and I want to come back and do it your way, and, and I want to learn to do these things that this cowboy preacher's been talking about. If that's you, raise your hand, and I'd love to lead you in a prayer. Anybody, anywhere. Amen. Well, does anybody just want to be a better father today? How about that? Anybody? There's one, there's two, there's a whole bunch of guys that want to be a better father. Well, keep your hands up and let's pray. Y'all can pray this with me if you want to. So just say, Father, the desire of my heart is to be the best father that I can be. And I just ask you, Father, to touch my heart, to stir up in me the desire to be diligent in, in seeking you and to, to get you to help me be the best father I can be. And I'm asking you with my whole heart, Lord. And I'm asking you to guide my steps. And I'm repenting that I haven't done everything I could do and help me to do all that I need to do, Father. Help me to, to even if my kids are grown, help me to love them more. Help me to, to be there more for them. Help me to... To, to want to be better all of the time, Father, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. How many of you still glad you came to church? Amen. How many of you know it ain't time to go home yet? How many of you are fathers? Some of you are going to be better fathers now, I hope. But if you're a father, we would like for you to come down. We have a little gift for you just to say Happy Father's Day, and we want to pray over you. And... Uh, 
and we want to give you a little gift. Come on, dads. Give them a hand. Amen. What a bunch of fathers. Wow. Amen. Amen. Why don't y'all just gather around and touch each other and, and uh, so we're all connected. Amen. Amen. Father, right this minute, I just want to thank you for all these fathers that you brought to Cowboys for Jesus. And Lord, I, I know these men that are, that are seeking you with their whole hearts. And I just ask you, Father, to bless them on this Father's Day. I ask you to, we honor them, Father, because I know all of them have tried to be the best father they can. And some of us still want to be better, Lord. So, Lord, I just impart your peace to them. And I just ask you to stir up in each of them a, a hunger and a thirst to know you better and to... Uh, just put an anointing on them, Father, of fatherhood, that they would just strive to, to be the best father they can and to, to follow your example of love and kindness and mercy and grace, Father. It's the goodness of God that draws a man to repentance, and sometimes it's the goodness of the, the earthly fathers that draw their sons and daughters closer to them. So, Lord, just help us all to be what you want us to be, and let us let us just want to get to know you better, Father. Stir up in each of us a hunger and a thirst for your word and a hunger and a thirst for your righteousness, Father. And just bless every one of these men and bless their sons and daughters and, and, uh, and get a hold of their sons and daughters, Father, and just turn their hearts back to the, to the mothers and fathers, Lord. Just, just bring families together the way they ought to be together, Father, and help us all to, to have unity in our, in our hearts first with you and then with our our wives, then with our children, and, and then with our church, Father. Lord, bring unity to this little body here, Father, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Yeah, we have a gift for you. We have two buckets. You get to, you get to choose a color. So pick your color and have a bandana. Amen. Anybody got anything else they want to say? How do you know when you've been to a cowboy church? Y'all come back now, you hear? <laughs> Amen. <laughs>